Rose Chiachi, and I'm the Executive Director of the Pike County Public Library. I'm here to today to tell you how to sign up for a library card. If you're a Pike County resident, it's really easy. You just stop by with proof of residency and a photo ID, and we'll get you all signed up. If you're not a resident, it's also really easy. You can just stop by with a photo ID, and for $35, you'll have full access to all of the library resources. Unfortunately, right now, our buildings aren't open to the public, but you can still sign up for a library card on our website, www.pcpl.org. Whether you're doing research for a project or looking for some inspiration, we can absolutely help you find what you're looking for. A really cool thing about libraries is that if we don't have the item that you're looking for, we can find it for you, no problem. We have a huge network of libraries in Pennsylvania and the entire country that we can borrow from on your behalf. Please check out our website, www.pcpl.org, for all of the virtual opportunities we're offering right now, or give us a call with any questions. Finally, I want to thank everyone from Peters Valley for bringing these great programs to our community and including the library. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the program. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. I'm Kristen Muller, Director of Peters Valley School of Craft, and um, we're very excited to have you joining us tonight. Um, I want to thank the Greater Pike County Community Foundation for funding this program for our partnership with the Pike County Public Library in Milford, Pennsylvania. Um, this is funded through the Richard L. Snyder Fund with the intention of bringing arts and culture to Pike County. And um, we're so um, lucky that despite this pandemic, we can now um, continue the le artist lecture series and broadcast it throughout the country and the world. And um, if you love this lecture tonight, you can watch it again on our YouTube channel. Um, that's under Peters Valley School of Craft. Um, so tonight we're, we welcome Alex Lozier. She is a jewelry artist and alchemist currently working and residing in the Hudson Valley in New York. She's inspired by the beauty of natural landscapes and organic materials and creates jewelry that adorns the body with crystals, bones, insects, and wood. Her work explores the intersection between the body and the spirit realm. She creates talismans that celebrate the beauty of the earth and awaken the inner magic of the soul. There's much love and intention that goes into each piece of jewelry that Alex creates. Each piece is infused with the healing life force energy of Reiki and enchanted with a sense of adventure. Alex considers herself a friend of the forest, which she takes very seriously. For every order placed on her website, Alex plants a tree through her partnership with One Tree Planted. She graduated from the University of the Arts in, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania with a BFA in crafts in 2010. She has received awards in excellence in jewelry from the Society of North American Goldsmiths at Peters Valley and at the Philadelphia Museum of Art craft shows. She has exhibited her work at craft shows, galleries and museums, and is also a certified Reiki master and stone alchemist. In her free time, Alex is an avid hiker, outdoor enthusiast, yogi, and lives an Ayurvedic lifestyle. She also has a ball python named Noodle. So tonight we welcome Alex. And I just wanna say that um, we, at the bottom of your screens, you've got uh, a Q and A section where you can place any questions you want to ask. So at the end of the lecture, we'll have Alex answer them. Um, and in the chat feature, we'll have information and links to additional information. So without further ado, welcome Alex. Hey everyone, thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to share myself with all of you. And I'm going to just start the slideshow in one moment. Okay, so my name is Alex Lozier. I am a jewelry artist and alchemist and a magical talisman maker for those of you that don't know me. And if you're wondering what a magical talisman is, it is a piece of jewelry created out of sacred objects of personal importance and infused with a specific intention. So a little bit about me and my background. I grew up in rural New Jersey. 
yes, this is New Jersey. It's actually quite a beautiful place. I know all of you Peters Valley people know this. Um, this is a picture of the Delaware Water Gap. So growing up, I spent a lot of time hiking around in the woods with friends and family members. So I was a nature lover and also an animal lover from a very young age. I had almost every single pet there was to have growing up. This is a picture of me and my baby piggy named Pudgy. And um, when I was a kid, this is how I got around the neighborhood. I used to ride my pig around. <laughs> Um, so as you can see, um, this is me a little bit older and not much has changed. I'm still a nature lover and sometimes I love the earth so much I just feel like I need to get inside of it. So as Kristen had mentioned, I went to the University of the Arts in Philadelphia where I studied glass blowing and metal smithing. But I didn't really have my aha moment in my art until I actually cut a week of school and went out to the Tucson Gem Show. And the stones just made me feel the most amazing, pure sensation of being in absolute awe. I would just look at things at the gem show and just be like, oh my God, I can't believe that this came out of the earth. It was the most exciting thing to me. So I very quickly fell in love with gems, with stones, and um, the Tucson gem show became my happy place. I loved um, looking at all the different colors and textures and patterns of the stones. And sometimes quite honestly, I just couldn't even believe my eyes it was the most inspiring thing to me that I'd ever experienced at this point in my life. Um, so this was really the beginning of the inspiration of all of my work that would come after this experience. So after um, college, I graduated in 2010 with a BFA in crafts. I moved to New York City and I ended up building a communal silversmithing studio so I rented a big warehouse space. I bought all of the equipment that I needed to make my work. And this was before the time of Brooklyn Metalworks. There was no um, communal studios. So I just figured if you build it, they will come. So I built this studio and I invited other emerging jewelry artists to come and make their work in my space. And they did, they came and we had a beautiful um, jewelry community. I ran this space for about six and a half years. And this is where I began to build my body of work. And this is where my career really started. Um, I unofficially called the studio Touch of Grey because I am a deadhead. And I also was working as a glass blower. Um, during this time at Brooklyn Glass and at Urban Class and was very involved in those communities as well. So this was really the beginning of my work. Um, I had spent four years living in Philadelphia and after that I lived in New York City for seven years. So when I started making this work, I was using materials that I had either found while out hiking around out in nature or that I had gotten at a gem show. And when I was doing this, I started building this body of work with a deep sense of nostalgia. After growing up in rural New Jersey and having such easy access to being in the woods whenever I wanted, I didn't realize that when I decided to move to the city, how much I would miss it and how much it really was such a big part of who I am as a person. So I was creating this work with a deep longing for the natural world. And I was using these organic found objects as a way to map my memories of these natural places that I had been to. And also using it as a way to carry these places with me and feel like I was immersed in nature all of the time. So these are some of my early pieces of jewelry.
And then in 2015, I was invited to be a fellow at the Creative Glass Center of America at Wheaton Arts in South Jersey. So I was granted a three month residency where I lived here and I was given a studio and I was able to just make my work. And part of your residency that you're required to do something for the public when you are a fellow. So that can either be some sort of demonstration or a performance. Um, when I did my residency, there were actually six other fellows that I was sharing my residency with. So I had proposed the idea that we all collaborate and do a performance together. So we came up with this idea of doing a performance that was based on schoolyard games. So our performance was called Recess. And we had glass Django where we hot ladled glass bricks and stack them all on top of each other. And then we also had glass badminton. One of the other fellows was a flame worker. So she made this little glass birdie and then we pulled a, um, a glass cane net and we were <laughs> playing glass um, badminton over this glass, hot glass net that we made. Um, and my skit was glass archery. And this is a video. So I had made these glass arrows and my dear friend Phil here was brave enough to get in this Kevlar stew and we blew this giant rondelle, which is essentially a big plate and he used it as a shield. And this was our, our finale. Um, so there were some other folks, these, um, fine folks right here uh, that were also at Wheaton. We were at Wheaton for an event totally different from our performance. They were actually doing their own event. But um, Phil, the guy in the Kevlar suit, um, knew these people. And they actually have their own archery business. So this is my friend Tim and Jess of Warpath Archery. And they came to our performance. Obviously, they loved it because it had glass archery. and a beautiful friendship was formed. So we ended up um, coming up with this trade where um, Tim, who is actually 100% Native American, he's half Apache and half Hopi, um, we did a trade where I taught him and his wife how to blue glass. And they taught me how to make arrows using traditional Native American techniques. And so this was the moment for me in my residency where the residency really came alive. And so these were some of the different um, styles of fletching that he taught me how to make on different arrows. So the fletching is um, the arrow, or excuse me, it's the part of the arrow that is the feather. And so I actually did an entire series of glass arrows where I made little crystals for the bullet tips and then pulled this fancy cane and then with the fletching techniques that Tim taught me, um, fletched um, turkey tail feathers onto the arrow and then made a little bronze knock at the end there. The knock is the part of the arrow that attaches to the bowstring. So this was a really fun project for me to work on. And Tim also gifted me many um, materials to create my artwork with. And we're going to see some of those photos later on in the slide. So then I began my craft show career after the end. Um, this is me at my first craft show ever. I did the Philadelphia Museum of Art craft show and I won the best in jewelry award and things really started to take off from there. Um, then I was invited to exhibit my work at the Museum of Art and Design in New York City, and also won the Society of North American Goldsmiths Award at the Peters Valley Craft Show. So during this time, I was traveling around, I was exhibiting my work at different shows and was still continuing to build a body of work using natural materials. And during this time, I knew that the work that I was creating 
was out of a great reverence for nature and I knew that Mother Earth was my muse, but I really wanted to dive deeper. I knew that there was a greater meaning to the work that I was doing and that it was really important. And this is when my exploration of the esoteric arts really began. So when I was at Wheaton, actually, I had began reading books about alchemy, excuse me, which essentially alchemy is just the art of transformation. And this was also influencing some of the glass that I was blowing while I was there. A lot of that stuff actually ended up in the garbage and I didn't really document that part of my work very well. So I apologize, there's not that many um, images of the glass that I've made over the years. Um, but I was blowing a lot of scientific looking glass and was using it to display my jewelry and my small sculptures. So I was blowing a lot of bell jars and beakers, these types of forms. So there was this interesting play between the natural and the scientific developing in my aesthetic. And I was becoming increasingly interested in the energetic properties of stones. As I was building this work, oops. And um, the best work really happened when I actually got out of the way. So the way that I like to describe my creative process is that it's more like being a psychic medium where I'm actually just channeling the energies of the stones. So I'm really consider myself to be a conduit of the earth. That's how I make my work. It's not really about me imposing my will onto um, these objects and making them into something, if you will. It's really a co-creative relationship and I'm really asking these objects, well, who do you wanna be with? Who do you wanna live with? And thinking the jewelry as of this, as site-specific installation on the body and creating new homes for these objects to live in out of the context of their natural environment. And what I was finding was that each of the stones had its own unique message and each of the stones was interacting with my clients in their own unique way as well. So there was some magic brewing here. Um, I also simultaneously was having these really intimate nature experiences, specifically with creatures where they're the entire message and essence of being is about the process of transformation. So this was actually a little caterpillar that decided to cocoon itself inside of this broken chain that was in my studio when I was at Wheaton during my residency. And I just was so grateful that he shared such a vulnerable moment with me in his transformative process. I never actually got to see him hatch, but, um, or emerge, I should say, from his cocoon, but I blew a little bell jar to keep him safe so that he wouldn't get stepped on and um, let him do his thing and transform. This was another intimate nature experience I have. Um, this is a timber rattler that I encountered in Harriman State Park. This snake was pretty huge, guys. It, this was probably five or six feet long, um, but it wasn't aggressive. It wasn't scary. I got pretty close to it, probably closer than I should have, to be honest. Um, but again, another animal that its energy is all about shedding and this transformative process. And I actually think this was taken on the same hike. Um, again, a lot of energy about shedding and transformation. So this is actually a cicada that is crawling out of its shell. So this process is called molting. And I actually did a very extensive body of work using cicadas, um, which we'll see later on in the presentation. So, uh, 
I began collecting these objects from nature, um, specifically with this cicada body of work. I began collecting these, um, these are called moltings, these cicada shells that they leave behind on the trees after they crawl out of their skin. And I began constructing new homes for these discarded parts of these objects to live in. So they became small scale sculptures. They also became um, pieces of jewelry. So this is actually um, three different mineral specimens that I spliced together, if you will. Um, so this is a hematite specimen with an iron oxide quartz. Um, this is some miscellaneous mineral. I'm just going to call it because I have no idea what it is. Um, and then this is actually a smoky citrine crystal that I made a little sterling silver seat and carved into this other stone. So even though these objects weren't formed together in nature, they really wanted to live together in a very seamless way. And they just fit together and it just made sense and it told a story. And then it also gave this little guy a home to live in outside of the context of his natural environment. So I then went on to make this piece. So this is also a cicada. So I'm exploring this being, this cicada at different stages in its life cycle. And this piece to me was actually really cool because this was a true collaboration with nature itself. And what I mean by that is that these cicada wings I found in this stone wall that was at my dad's house. And this creature, this insect, it was eaten by another insect called a cicada killer, which is a really aggressive looking giant wasp, essentially. And so cicada killers, they catch the cicadas, they eat the insides, and then they leave the wings and the shells behind. And so the cicada killer actually did a lot of the work for me and left me plenty of material to work with in a nice, neat, little abundant pile. Um, so I actually was able to gather many cicada wings and created this piece. So this cicada um, was hollowed out by the cicada killer. So it's just an empty shell here. And then the wings were actually sandwiched between microscope slides and mica. And then this is an aquamarine crystal and the whole piece is a brooch. So again, working with insects, this is a beetle. And this bumblebee was actually given to me by a friend and I actually love bumblebees. They've been getting a lot of attention lately because they're becoming increasingly more endangered. And um, bumblebees are particularly special, well, any bee actually really, not just bumblebees, um, honeybees in particular, but the entire life cycle is dependent upon the bees because they're pollinators. And so, this bee was found and it was gifted to me by a friend. And I really wanted to do something to honor the bee. And I really wanted to think about a way that I could preserve it. And so when I was making this piece, it was actually really important to me to preserve the fuzz of the bee while I was making it. And so I did kind of a kooky thing and I, actually dissected this bee. So I took the bee apart into little different sections and I made these little sterling silver legs for him. So these, he now has metal legs and I carved wings out of mica for him. And then I filled him with resin, put him back together. And then I made a home for him to live outside of the context of his natural environment. So these were actually two twigs that I found spliced together and then through a direct bronze process, excuse me, a direct burnout process was able to cast them in bronze and then set a fire opal in the bud 
And the whole piece lives in this um, glass test tube that I blew. So this is a wall piece. And this piece is called Colony of One. So again, it's touching on the idea that the bee is this very sacred being that the entire life cycle is dependent upon, but that are so precious now because they are so endangered. So as I was working with these insects and these animals that have such a profound transformative quality about the essence of their being, I found that I was transforming as well. I was going through a deep transformative healing process as I was creating and wearing this jewelry and my interests, my thought patterns were shifting, the circle of people around me were shifting, my consciousness was evolving and I was having a spiritual awakening. I just didn't know it yet because I didn't come from a spiritual background. So I didn't really have a language around describing these experiences that I was having, but I was developing a sacred relationship with myself. And it really was the beginning of a self-love revolution for me. So then I met this guy. Um, this is Robert Simmons. He is the author of the Book of Stones. And he had a conference in Burlington, Vermont about the alchemy of stones. So my studio mate and I, we decided to go and it was a life changing experience. So we learned about various types of crystal healing and how this fits into alchemical philosophy. So this is me with my um, stone alchemist certification, which I was very proud of. So this piece was very inspired by my experience at the Stone Alchemy Conference. I had already been studying and learning and was interested in alchemy, but this for me, it really helped me to build a language around the deeper meaning of the work that I was creating. And so for those of you that are not familiar with alchemy, as a practice. Um, the ancient alchemists, they were famous for trying to turn lead into gold, but that's actually a metaphor for transforming the density of our physical human experience here on earth into the gold of spiritual awakening. And the ancient alchemists, they had a saying that goes as above, so below, as within, so without. And so what this is really talking about is this idea of the micro and the macrocosm and that the parts reflect the whole and the whole reflects the part. So what happens to one affects the other and vice versa. So with this concept in mind that is prevalent in everything, all of nature, all of existence really, um, I kept coming back to this idea, well then, if I heal myself, I'm healing the planet. So the job of the alchemist then becomes to transform the inner self, to change and to create positive change in the outer world. And that's what my goal was. Or I should say, that's what my goal still is. So this is called the Euroboros, and the Euroboros is the ancient alchemist symbol of infinity of the snake eating its own tail. So this is actually a rattlesnake head, which I'd already had an intimate nature experience with. And this rattlesnake head was gifted to me by my Native American friend, Tim, who I showed you in the previous slide that has the amazing archery business. And this piece is so special to me, not only because of what it symbolizes, but also because of the story of how it came into being. I had a, an intimate experience with this creature out in nature. This rattlesnake head was gifted to me by somebody that had a very profound impact on my art. And then this piece was birthed out of this 
spiritual experience that I had at the Alchemy of Stones conference with Robert Simmons. So this piece to me was a really like a birthing, a, a new birthing of a deeper meaning in my work. And at the Crystal Conference, I met this lady. This is Sally Crow. She is a psychic medium from Vermont. And she did a spirit gallery reading at the Crystal Conference, which is something that I totally was not expecting and was not at all really a part of my consciousness. But Sally got up on stage and she was like, my name is Sally Crow. Uh, and I talk to dead people when you die this is how it works. This is what happens. And I was just on the edge of my seat the whole time. I was like, what, what do you mean? This is how it works. How do you know that? Like, and she did, she proceeded to call at least like 10 people on stage and talk to their beloved dead. And it was the most amazing ex thing I had ever experienced. And it really shifted my, my consciousness and my perspective about what life is and what is possible. And it really opened the door to the spirit realm for me. I began to have my own experiences with the unseen realm after that. And ever since that experience, I began calling Sally my spiritual teacher. Um, so a few years later, I went on a four-day raccoon medicine retreat with her and her sister, Sandy, where we learned um, different techniques for communicating with nature spirits. So these are the fine folks that I was on retreat with. Um, so we learned about how to communicate with nature spirits and the unseen world. And I had been building this relationship with Sally over the last um, couple of years. And she has recently accepted me as one of her apprentices, which she calls the weird weavers. So I'm actively engaging and fine tuning my natural psychic abilities into a refined skill under Sally's guidance. And we are currently in the process of building and co creating a, a jewelry collection based on the elements. So stay tuned. That's something that will probably be coming out later this year. So after this mind blowing experience of interacting with the unseen world, I was not only working with stones, but I also was working with skulls, bones, different animal parts in my jewelry as well. And I did a whole series of skull necklaces. And for me, this work was really about questioning the intersection of the earth, of our body, and of the spirit realm. And again, using the body as site-specific installation. So really exploring this idea of the circle of life and that part of our being that is eternal, that spiritual realm of ourselves. And when I was creating this piece in particular, I actually had a deep ancestral healing on my, um, in my maternal lineage, which I found to be really interesting because if you look at the color palette of it, it's very soft, it's very feminine. And this is actually a raccoon skull that was gifted to me by a raccoon. Raccoon medicine is a lot about the masks that we wear. And so this piece for me was really the beginning of me beginning to accept this deeper part of myself and my work and really being able to share this part of myself with the world really, because up until this point, this was something that was very private to me. And then I was invited to be an artist in residence at the Wilderness Workshop in Aspen, Colorado. If you ever have the chance to go there, it is amazingly beautiful. Um, some of you, if you've been to Colorado, you might recognize these mountains. They're pretty famous. These are called the Maroon Bells outside of Aspen. And so you can see I'm pretty stoked to be there. Um, 
this landscape was just absolutely breathtaking. And I really loved my time at the wilderness workshop because it wasn't necessarily an art residency in the sense that it wasn't my job to be making my art while I was there. My job while I was there was to be an artist inspired by nature, which is exactly what I do. And so I just really got to revel in every single second of being here and just enjoying the landscape. And so the Wilderness Workshop just invites artists to come experience this beautiful place. And then the artists that are selected create artwork that is inspired by their time there. And then um, the artwork is auctioned off and that money is used for wilderness conservation, which is something that is so dear to me. So I just loved everything about this. And what I found when I was in Colorado was that the landscape, although it was incredibly beautiful, it also had a ruggedness to it, even the plants. Um, I got to visit an abandoned silver mining town while I was there, which was pretty cool um, and had some spirit encounters while I was here. This landscape was also in Colorado. This was unlike any other place that I had been during my time there. This was in Marble, Colorado. And um, something that I enjoyed doing outside of my um, jewelry making practice is that I create crystal grids in natural locations as well as in my studio to create sacred space. So this is a crystal grid that I built on the fall equinox to um, just celebrate the landscape. And this was using um, some of the natural rocks that were in that waterfall bed and some crystals that I had gotten at the Denver Gem Show before I went out there. Um, and so this was actually one of the rocks that I had found during my time in Colorado that really spoke to me. So this rock I ended up keeping. I took this one home and this was one of the pieces that I created and donated um, to the Wilderness Workshop. And this was another piece. So these um, crystals were not rocks that I found in Aspen. These were crystals that I had gotten at the Denver Gem Show, which was somewhere that I went before I actually made my way to Aspen for my residency. And then after my time in Colorado, I moved out of New York City and I moved to the beautiful Hudson Valley. I live in Peekskill, New York now. I'm still here and I love it. And you can see that I am just so happy to be back in my natural habitat. And I just feel so grateful that I can get into the woods whenever I please and I, love living in a beautiful place. I love that I can appreciate nature every day. And I love that I can be so close to the source of inspiration of my work. I have a sacred relationship with the land. And that's something that I take very seriously. I spend a lot of time in the woods. Whenever I see garbage out on a hike, I never walk by it. I always pick it up. You can ask my boyfriend. Sometimes I'm like walking around with like handfuls of garbage because I just can't stand to leave it behind. And I plant a tree for every single um, sale that I make on my website. And I hope that I can plant a whole forest someday. Um, and when I moved to Peekskill, my, the direction of my work definitely started shifting. So 
what I've been doing since I've moved up here is that I'm still working with stones, I'm still working with natural materials, but I've shifted the way that I think about the work that I'm making where I'm really telling a story and I'm sort of like creating these fantasy realities that I get to be the main character of. So when I'm creating a collection, it's not just about the pieces of jewelry that are being made. It's also about, okay, well, what are the outfits? What are the colors? What are the textures? Where does the scene take place? And so there's a real narrative quality to the work now. And I'm actually finding that to be a lot of fun. And it's such a different way of working than I'm used to. So these um, pieces and these photos that you're looking at, these were from my season of the witch collection, which obviously is right up my alley. I do consider myself to be a witch if you couldn't already tell. Um, and then I also did a mermaid collection, which was very inspired by the river. I live in a little river town in the Hudson Valley now, and it's just it has a really amazing energy. So this looks like it's the beach, but it's actually um, it's actually the Hudson River. So this was the mermaid collection and this was using aquamarines to tell the story of the sea. So these were some of Neptune's tridents that I had made. And the theme of this was all about becoming a goddess of the sea. And so when I built this collection, I really got to fulfill a childhood dream of mine of becoming a mermaid. Um, so it's just a much more fun and whimsical way for me to work and I'm really enjoying it. And that's all for now. Thank you, Alex. Um, we've got, if anybody has questions, please pop them into the Q&A. Um, I have the first question is from uh, Nada Khalil. Do you need to treat or preserve the shells in some way? Um, I'm assuming that you're talking about the shells of the cicadas. And yes, I had a very serious like insect taxidermy process that I would do. So I used resin and shellac and I would um, do my best to preserve them. That's great. Barbara Rudnick says, you're brilliantly creative. <laughs> Thank you. It's not a question, but um, I- I'll see. take it. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, then uh, Steve Klein says, both Sally and Alex are the real deal. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Thank you. <laughs> ML Grout says, lovely pieces. Do you begin with a stet, stit sketch or do you create as you go? Like, do you sketch out your pieces and think them through? I don't. And that's actually what's sort of difficult for me when, well, it's not difficult, but um, I, like, I'm not a traditional artist. So like kind of what I was saying about my creative process where I liken it more to being a psychic medium than I do to being an artist. It's not really about my will or what I want. Um, so I always start with the objects. I always start with the stones. So sometimes it can be a little tricky when I work with clients because I have a vision in my head, but I'm not really like a drawer or a sketcher. Um, what I do like to do though, is I like to just show people the material. And I um, have this like sticky tack and I love to just like stick things together and I can kind of like give people an idea that way. Um, but it's definitely a much different way of working. It's not that I can't draw, I can. It's just not my preferred method because again, this work is not really about me or my will. It's about the objects and the stones be able, being able to communicate their message and who do they want to live with. So for me, it always starts with the objects. That's great. Well, a few more comments. Let's see. We've got Patricia Meidel saying, extremely enjoyable and informative. Thank you. 
And then Joyce Kalstein is saying, I've worked with Alex for several years to create amazing jewelry. We blend our visions to create amazing jewelry, Joyce. So, so is Joyce a jeweler or a client? So Joyce is a client of mine. And what I love about working with Joyce is that she actually is such a patron of the arts and she likes everything to be super custom. So it's actually really fun to work with her because it's also kind of my style that when I work one-on-one -on -one with people, for me, it's really about co-creating. So it's this really collaborative feel and Joyce is always really excited and she brings her own ideas. So it's it's been, I've actually made um, quite a few pieces for her over the years. And it's always just really fun to see where it turns out, especially having somebody that, um, you know, it's, it's fun when somebody kind of like can have their own idea and input, but not be super rigid. So it's always just fun to see what turns out. That's great. Um, Linda Van Hart says, do you, do you use silver, uh, liver of sulfur or d to darken your metal? And yes. do you feel it? Do you use liver of sulfur? Okay. Yeah. And you mm -hmm. seal your metal after it's treated with liver of sulfur. Um, I use um, Renaissance wax when I am finished, um, mostly because it prevents fingerprints from getting on the metal, especially like if you're making something with sheet. Um, but I don't necessarily know that it makes the oxidation stay on any longer. What I like to communicate to my clients that I work with is that silver is the energy of the moon. And so it's constantly on a journey from either dark to light or light to dark. And it's just what the metal does. So when you try and just um, think about what the energy of the metal is and not try and um, stop it from changing, because it, it's kind of going against the the natural rhythm of what the metal wants to do. Um, yeah, that's why I like to oxidize everything because when you do that and then you allow the metal to just um, gradually lighten where it touches the skin with wear, the silver, it just develops these absolutely beautiful antique highlights. And then the silver becomes so much more low maintenance as well. I mean, who wants to pol like polish their jewelry? Not me. <laughs> That's great. I like that. Yeah. Um, so Rachel Wengenroth, who is also a jeweler, she's in Kingston, New York. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Is saying, are you looking for insect donations? I have some in interesting finds. Always, always. Yeah. People mail me weird things all the time. Um, one of my favorite things was I did the Baltimore craft show one year and I met a woman that loved my work. She didn't end up buying a piece, but the next day she came to my booth and she brought me a dehydrated frog. I have no idea where she got it from, <laughs> but I was like, wow, that's so cool. Thank you. She was like, you're going to make something amazing with this. Actually, I still have it. I haven't made anything with it, but maybe I should pull it out. <laughs> but yeah, people have given me all kinds of weird things and I love it. So yeah, send, send it my way. Uh, what's interesting too, uh, we had a, a student at Peters Valley who had all these beautiful beetles and I didn't realize that there was a tradition, like Victorian era tradition of these like actual, those blue beetles. Yeah. Jewelry making. Who knew? Um, Daniel De Silva says he, he has his students watching and what advice can you provide them for the future of jewelry design? Oh, wow. Um, hmm. The future of jewelry design. Well, I think that it's changing a lot. Um, I actually recently heard a rumor that I'm hoping is false that my school actually, um, the University of the Arts, got rid of their crafts program to make room for ID which is industrial design, which like really breaks my heart because we had the most amazing crafts program. Um, I'm really hoping that is a false rumor, but it makes sense to me. I mean, I think that having those kinds of skills like being able to do CAD and rendering and those kinds of things are helpful. They can be. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think something kind of gets lost in pieces like that, but there's definitely some really cool things you can do. So I think that maybe 
skills like that are good to have in your tool belt. Those are skills that I don't have. I'm personally just not interested in anything like that. But sometimes I wonder, hmm, you know, like maybe is there an easier way to do some things that I just is out of my skill set. Um, I also think that um, automation and AI is the future and that's going to be really serious. And what I will say about my skill set is that a machine can't do it. A machine will never be able to make my work. And that I think artists really are the future. Handmade is the future. And I think we're seeing or we will, we are already seeing, but I think we will be seeing more of a respect and a revival of handmade because people are really longing for that. People text all day and they're on their phones and they don't know what to do with their hands. I mean, your hands are the most amazing things, right? Like it's how you interact with the world and it's, it's, your life is what you make with your hands. So I think that it's good um, to really have respect for both, you know, like if you're really wanting to do jewelry as a career, it's good to know that high tech stuff because it definitely has its place. But, you know, I think that using your hands, that's really like where, where the soul is. And, you know, you, you can tell a commercial piece of jewelry. It's like really easy to spot. And I mean, it's obviously I have a very quirky taste, but um, you know, a lot of stuff looks the same. So it's great. Those are just my thoughts on it. Good thoughts. A um, couple of comments and a few more questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Gilda Edelstein says, thank you for sharing your knowledge. I love listening to your commentary. And Helen Drett English says, Alex, you are so very special and real. I love the power in your work. <laughs> Helen, I love you. I miss you. <laughs> um, ML Grout is asking, what metals do you use? Do you use fabric or th threads? Love your organic creativity. Um, I, I'm not understanding the thread question. Um, I primarily work with sterling silver. That's my favorite metal to work with. I have taken goldsmithing classes. I definitely think that gold has its place and it has its own unique properties, but I really just have been drawn to silver my entire life. Like my mom always and she still does. She, my mom wears like big gold hoop earrings. Maybe she's watching. I'm not sure. Hi, mom, if you're here. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just, I've never really been drawn to gold. I've always been drawn to silver. And I think what I really like about it again is this transformative quality of the metal and the properties that it has, that it's always changing. It's always on a journey. And it's, it's, it's feminine in that way, in the sense that it's always on the move, it's cyclical. And so that's my favorite metal to work with. Um, maybe in the future, I will have a change of heart and work more with gold. Um, but for now, silver is definitely my top choice. Great. Um, Ginger Chase says, well done, Alex. How do you sense the stones? Visual, tactile, energy? Question mark. Um, hmm. well, I'm very intuitive. So for me, I always have a deep knowing and I, I, I definitely have had some like physical energetic experiences with stones for sure. Um, but I think that that's not my, um, primary way of working. Um, I'm also a very visual person. So sometimes like, it's really easy for me to just see, like I'm a seer. Um, I can just see, oh, these, these belong together and I just have a deep knowing. And honestly, that's really like the magic of like, for me, like how a piece is made. I'm just like, oh, these, these things belong together. Let's make that happen. And then it's just really problem solving and engineering of figuring out, okay, well, how do we do that? You know? Great. Um, so Nada is asking another question. I have multiple interests, so I'm interested in how you balance your interests of jewelry and glass. Do you find yourself working in both media simultaneously or do you find yourself sometimes focusing on one area more than the other? 
Hmm, that's a really good question. Um, when I was in school, I was very immersed in both um, because I had to be. Glass actually wasn't offered as a major at UArts until the year after I graduated, of course. But if it would have been, I definitely would have been a glass major and I would have quit jewelry for sure, 100%. Um, I really didn't actually enjoy learning to make jewelry at all. I hated it. I just did it so that I could blow glass because I loved blowing glass that much. Um, and then later in my career, when I had been working in the field for a few years, um, I don't know. I, I got hired as a metalsmith right out of college. Like I didn't take the summer off or anything. I immediately went to go work for Bibba Schutz um, as a full-time metalsmith um, in her studio in New York City. So I did that for about a year and a half. And during that time, I was 100% working on jewelry. I wasn't blowing glass. Um, and I really missed blowing glass. So I had to like relearn how to blow glass again, which was a really painstaking thing to do. Um, so there definitely were time periods in my life where blowing glass wasn't accessible to me. I'm actually in one of those time periods right now. So like for me, jewelry has always been the constant and I feel like jewelry has always chosen me. And thank God I like love doing it now. And that's because I'm much more skilled than I was. Um, but when I was first learning, I just felt like it was really painstaking and it took so long and it was, it was really challenging to learn how to do. Um, but you know, I, I, I got a job. I got a full-time job as a metalsmith. My skills got really good. It became faster, it became easier, it became more fun. Um, and for me also, it made more sense because my love isn't metalsmithing. My love is the stones my love is the earth objects. So glass blowing, it only really got me so far in that sense. So I mean, honestly, I've actually haven't blown glass in, I don't know, maybe a year or two now. Um, part of that definitely was a conscious choice to be like, I'm just focusing on my jewelry business and expanding this part of my life and my work. Um, and you know, part of that also was the pandemic. I mean, when you blow glass, it's like everyone's sharing blow pipes and you're just committed to have everyone having the same germs. So I have no idea how my friends that are blowing glass in the city are like even doing what they do. <laughs> they, they've figured out new ways. You have to look at the Corning Glass um, website. Thing. It's crazy to me because it's like we've all been developing these skills as glass blowers for like thousands of years. And now it's like, mm. oh, you can't even do that. So, yeah, but I don't know. I, I haven't been a part of any of that. So right nearby Peters Valley, there's this Franklin mine. Um, and Patricia Mueller's asking if you've ever seen it, the fluorescent minerals. Like, you, it's, it's like 20 minutes from Peters Valley. And so I actually because I grew up in New Jersey, I went on a field trip there as a kid and I thought it was like the most amazing thing. And they take you in this cavern with all of these black lights and the whole cave is like day glow, neon, like splattered paint. It's insane. And they told us that we could keep one stone. And I was just like, Oh my God. And so I was like running around this like cave, like <laughs> collecting all of these rocks. And I like made a little pile and then I had to like figure out like which one I was going to take. And I was, I mean, I forget how old I was, but like the point is that I was small enough that I didn't really like get the idea that like when you walk out of the mine, the the stone is not in black light anymore so you can't see the fluorescent anyway mm. i just it was the most disappointing moment i would just like i was so excited i made this rock pile and then i picked one and then i walked out of the mine and it just looked like a regular rock and i was like oh this sucks <laughs> <laughs> but now you're looking for that deeper energy right there you go yeah definitely. <laughs> um 
Gilda Edelstein says, would you say that industrial design disrespects the earth because of what it takes from it? I don't know. Um, that's definitely a question that pains me for sure. Um, I mean, I even think about that in my work, like when I go to gem shows and stuff and I think about, well, does the earth really like that we're taking all of these or, you know, do, do we... Ugh, I don't know. It's such a difficult question, you know, because these things are being mined and they're being harvested. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't have a great answer. I'm afraid. Um, it's definitely something that I think about a lot. I always try and whenever I have the ability to get something that's ethically sourced, that's ethically mined. I actually have a friend of mine that's a gem dealer that I used to help at the gem shows actually my friend Paul over at Naro Africa. And he actually has close relationships with the miners and a lot of those stones are mined by hand. And that's something that's really unique often what happens when you are working with stones, a lot of the story of the stone, the way it came out of the earth gets lost or it's deliberately hidden from you. So I don't know. I think that we as humans need to really heal our broken relationship with the earth and heal our broken relationship with ourselves. I mean, we're definitely um, doing things in an unsustainable way. And, um, you know, we, we need to have some major changes. I don't have all the answers, but it's something I definitely think about a lot. Thank you. Linda Van Hart, um, is asking, do you incorporate commercial chains in your pieces or make all your own? Your bezi making is really great. It looks oh, like you. you texture some of them. Do you do this on a rolling mill? Um, so like these big chains, these are all handmade. I actually love making chain. I think it's like the most Zen activity. Like if I have to work, but I not really in a place where I want to think, I just want to like do something very meditative. Like for me, that's what chain making is. So a lot of these like bigger chains, I make these like little teeny tiny chains. Honestly, this is a waste of my time to make. So this is a commercial chain. Um, so I, I do like small chains. Um, I will just buy commercial chain and I don't really feel that it takes away from my work in any way. Um, but sometimes I, I mix it like, and sometimes I add beads. So, you know, this is a commercial chain, but I added a segment of beads. Um, and I do things to the chain, like this piece, for example. If I can unclip it. Um, I do things to the chains to customize them so that you can wear the chain short and doubled or you can wear it long. So even though I'm working with a commercial chain, I'm really personalizing it and making it my own. So I do things like that. Um, and the texture question, no, I do not do the texturing in my rolling mill that's certainly something you can do. Um, but I do my texture through forging. Great. Well, Rachel Wengenroth says such an inspiration and passion in this webinar with Alex. Thank you, PV. We miss you, Rachel. Um, uh, Cynthia Caffrey says, what materials and techniques did you use for the earrings you're wearing? Hmm. All right, so these are really fun and really time consuming to make. So these earrings, these are all clear quartz crystals. Hopefully you can see them. Um, but essentially I need nine crystals and I need nine crystals well, I guess I need 18 crystals because I need nine for each side. So you can see that the crystals, they 
not only get smaller in width, but they get shorter in length. So they have like an ascending and descending feel to them as they spiral in. And I so the first step is to find pairs. So I have to pair them all, right? So I have to find nine pairs. Then I have to cut them to size. So I have like a little rock saw that I use. Um, so I cut them and then I do the settings. So the settings of these, and I actually make them a little bit better now. This is the first pair that I ever made of these. So on these, you can see that they have two sides of the setting is metal or two facets of the stone, I should say, and then the bottom. So now I actually do three sides of the setting metal because it just protects the stone a little bit more. Um, but so this is all through a scoring and bending technique. So this takes a long time. And then I solder each of the settings on to this hoop frame. So this was something that I originally fabricated and then made a mold of so I can replicate this spiral shape now. And then um, just solder the settings on. Wonderful. Um, two, um, I'm gonna put together two comments here. Uh, so Nada saying, is it difficult to find dealers who supply ethically sourced stones and how do you get connected with them and or make sure they're ethically mined and sourced? And then Stephen Hirsch says, I've had the same trouble with using gold or silver that has been recently mined because of what that means for the environment, but I have found that I'm interested in using old silver or gold from discarded jewelry and repurpose it as well as transform it into my designs. I've been making one of a kind jewelry for 50 years and it's just lately that I've seen the light. Love you, Alex. Aw. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, if you are able to melt down old jewelry, that's great. Sometimes it's not the best thing to do though, especially if the piece of jewelry has a lot of solder seams, you're not gonna want a lot of solder in your um, metal that you're working with that can cause a lot of problems. Um, so I don't know, it just, it depends on what the piece of jewelry is. So that's just something to be aware of. There are companies like Hoover and Strong that do a lot of refining. So um, you can work with professionally mined, or excuse me, professionally refined metal and still get a high quality mill product um, because the majority of their products are coming from old jewelry. Um, so that's something to check out. As far as sourcing stones, um, you know, like I said, I've gone to a lot of gem shows since 2008. So, I mean, for me, a lot of it is just building relationships with people that I've met at gem shows. I personally love my friend Paul over at Naro Africa, not only because he's a friend of mine, but I like supporting his business because I like what it stands for. He specializes in working with African Bushmen and he Find, he funds whole mining projects. He deeply cares about the people that are mining his stones that he's working with. So, you know, not only are the stones being um, taken out of the earth in an ethical way, but the people that are mining the stones are also being treated fairly. Um, so that's something that I like about my friend Paul's business. Um, if you want to check him out, you can tell him I sent you over there. Um, yeah, that's I, hope, I hope I answered the whole question. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I, I would imagine it's a little bit like shopping for your food, like read the labels and ask questions, right? Ask for Yeah, definitely. And, you know, what I miss most about going to gem shows is that, I mean, I, like I said earlier, like I'm pretty intuitive. I just wouldn't buy a stone from somebody if I 
didn't feel good about them or their business or whatever, you know, I just would keep going. Um, now it's a little bit trickier um, because things are online. You know, you just have to use your best judgment um, and hope that if people say something is ethically sourced, that it actually is. That is a good question. Oh, is there, uh, let me see. Uh, Ursula Borbulis is saying, thank you so much for sharing your wonderful inspiration, your work and your inspiration. Adele Roth says, thank you so much for having this webinar. Lots of information and inspiration. I love your outlook on the world and inner self. Have to cut out early, but thank you so much and look forward to checking out your site. And uh, one, I think there was one more question, but I'm, I'm having trouble. Oh, here it is. ML Grout says, can you speak more about how you incorporate Reiki into your pieces? Yes, I would love to. So I, um, when I'm working, I definitely think of my studio as a sacred space, number one. So when I'm making jewelry, um, a lot of the time, the objects that I'm using, and this isn't something that I really talked about very much in the slideshow, but a lot of the work actually that I do in terms of the energy work um, happens before I even get to the making of the jewelry. So one thing that I like to do is I set up crystal grids, which are site-specific installations with the actual objects that then become my jewelry. So I, they're, they're basically kind of look like these geometric mandalas, if you will, um, of that are comprised of organic found objects. So crystals, stones, um, wood, herbs, whatever. It can be made out of anything. So I make these installations in tandem with astrological events. So I'll do this on the new and full moons. I'll do this on the equinoxes. We have one coming up in a couple of days, um, um, which are also um, pagan holidays. So we have Ostara, which is the spring equinox coming up soon. Um, so this is part of my sacred practice of something that I do. And so this enables me to create sacred space in my studio. And this also allows me to create deeper meaning in the jewelry that I am then creating. So these objects, they are already charged with a really powerful energy before I even bring them to the bench to make them into something. So I've created sacred space in my studio. I've charged the objects that I'm working with in this crystal grid with an astrological alignment. I make the piece and then when it's done, um, I have a little Reiki enchantment ceremony where I just get into a meditative space. And I really think about infusing the jewelry that I've created with the healing life force energy of Reiki so that when my clients wear the piece, they can feel loved. They can feel light coming into their life. They can feel joy and bliss. They can release anything that's no longer serving them. They can step into their power. And that's really my intention is that jewelry is a self-love ritual and that these are not accessories. These are magical talismans that have a big transformative intention behind them. So I infuse that intention with Reiki energy. Um, if any of you guys practice Reiki out there, I do work with the Reiki symbols. And I also, every single time that I charge a new piece of jewelry um, in Reiki, you can do, you can send Reiki healings um, across time and space. So you don't necessarily need to be um, present with something in an exact time or location in order to send a healing. Um, so you can send the healing across time and space. So I, every single time that I do a Reiki charge for a new client that I'm 
charging their piece. I also send like a booster, a Reiki booster to every other single piece of jewelry that I've made that is now in the hands of a client. And I started doing this actually during the pandemic because I felt that people need a little extra love out there. And mm -hmm. ever since I've started doing it, um, I really have no intention of stopping because it's an extra layer of meaning that I can create for my clients. And um, it, it, it really speaks to a deep part of my soul to, as an alchemist, to really try and create positive change in the world by transforming the inner self. So that is a lot of what my work is about. So that's a big part of my, my Reiki prayer for all of my jewelry and all of my clients. Well, thank you so much. A um, couple of things um, if, to all of our attendees that are still here. Um, there's an art party on March 18th and Alex has, and her friends are doing a virtual event. So if you'd like to join it, um, March 18th at 3.30 and 7.30 and April 15th at 3.30 and 7.30 and you can go to artpartycentral.org, right? Mm -hmm. And then also if any of you have additional comments or questions for Alex, you can contact her through her website, which is alexlozier.com. And thank you all for attending and for all your questions. And um, Alex, thank you so much. That was truly inspirational and wonderful. And we wish you all the best. And thank you so much for having me. And I think, yeah, um, there, there might be, I know that there was one person, Arlene Rubin, who's got her hand up, but I don't know what to do with that. I think she needs to um, maybe contact you directly. Um, with any additional questions, because I, I don't know what to do with that. I'm sorry, it's a new feature. <laughs> and, I, uh, do, I do see one last question from Nada. Oh, oh, sorry. That's okay. So Nada says, do you have any advice on how to start out a career as a metalsmith right after college? What equipment do you recommend starting with? Um, well, the first thing I would recommend is that you should go and work for somebody else. Um, that's what I did. That's what most people do. And the reason for that is because it takes a lot to run a jewelry business and you will learn a lot from, by working from somebody, you will get your skills up and you'll hopefully the person that you're working for will also, um, teach you about, how to run a jewelry business and you can see what that looks like and if that's something that you even want to do um as far as equipment it's really hard for me to answer that because i feel like that is really personal to the type of work that you make um i don't know um if i just had to guess and just say something really general across a broad spectrum you know i would say get a torch I'm not sure what kind of torch you use. I primarily use an acetylene torch. I, I do have other torches, but that's my main go-to um, with every size tip. Um, I, I do have a rolling mill and an anvil. Um, those are things that I got right away, but they're not necessarily things that you absolutely need. Um, you definitely do need hand tools though. Get a bench. Um, and make sure you have good ventilation, please, for the love of God. When I first started my career, I worked in a studio that had zero ventilation and, and we used Handy Flux, which has like major fluorides in it. And I'm just like, oh my God, I don't even wanna think about how many years of my life I sacrificed because of that. Um, so yeah, invest in good ventilation if you're gonna be soldering. That's great. Good, good advice. Yeah. Protect your eyes, protect your lungs. Yes. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alex. Have a wonderful evening. And thank you, Rachel, for handling all the behind the scenes tonight. Of Have course. Thank night. you. Right. Much love, everyone. Thank you. Good night.
Bye. Good night. Thank you so much for tuning in. We would like to thank our sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to receive more like it in the future.